That's Elvin Jones on drums. He's a composer and the band leader here. Uh, we heard from his brother Thad Jones on trumpet and Hank Mobley on tenor sax. This is a tune called Midnight Walk. I, I like it. It was uh, uh, produced in 1966 and became the the uh, track, the lead track, the title track of the album. This is Lead Stories. I'm Utrice Lead. And today we're going on tour. Uh, and we couldn't have a better tour guide. That's for sure. Does the name Dr. Gerald Horn mean anything to you? <laughs> yeah, that's him. Historian and prolific author Dr. Gerald Horn is conducting a people's tour today of significant issues and developments that we might have missed or the major media might have not covered or even misinterpreted in 2018. Dr. Horn, as you know, holds the John J. and Rebecca Morris Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He has written literally dozens of books, acclaimed books, and hundreds of articles, commentaries, and scholarly papers on struggles all over the world against imperialism, colonialism, fascism, and racism. And uh, I wonder whether you finished your most recent book yet. The last time we talked, you were just about to finish your most uh, recent book. Thanks for being with us today, Gerald. Okay. We're having some... Okay, we're getting him back. Uh, we lost him there for a minute. This is what happens. <laughs> this is life. But we are troopers. We just keep moving. Okay, so the, we're waiting for him to join us or rejoin us. I'm here, us. I'm here. Oh, are you there? I'm glad to know that you're there. Hello, Gerald. Happy New Year. Same to you. Thank you. Last time we talked, you were just up to your neck uh, in trying to finish up your most recent book. Have you done so? Oh, yeah, it's in copy editing. But actually, both of them are. Oh, Tell us about the two of them, then. <clears throat> well, they both come out in the late spring. Uh, white supremacy confronted U.S. imperialism and anti-communism versus the liberation of Southern Africa from Rhodes to Mandela. And then jazz and justice, racism and the political economy of the music. Oh, that sounds, that sounds like a, a, a great twofer. As soon let's as open. you're able, let's let's have a show on each of them, so that people would be uh, likely to get into the groove, as they say, with history. Well, let's hope. I'm so. so glad you. Do, I'm so glad you do this kind of work. Well, you're taking us on a tour today of 2018, and where do we start? Well, actually, let me start with last night, although. <laughs> Obviously, uh, Mr. Trump's speech has a lot to oh. do with preceding elements. I mean, first of all, uh, it's interesting and understandably, the mainstream press, New York Times, Washington Post, MSNBC, CNN, have been quite hostile, but that's nothing new. Of course, in some ways, they've been complicit in helping to create the environment that helps to ensure that Mr. Trump's base is not crumbling. I'm, I'm speaking to their decades-long struggle against the redistribution of the wealth, not only in North America, but in Central America. That is to say, crusades against the Arbenz government in Guatemala in 1954, that uh, you might recall that even Che Guevara, on a tour from his native Argentina, was passing through Guatemala in 1954, and the tumultuous events there helped to radicalize them. And then we know about the anti-communist wars in El Salvador against the Farabundi, Farabundi Marti National Liberation Front. Uh, 
which helped to inject a culture of violence into that small Central American nation, causing many to escape and flee, particularly to Los Angeles, where they where many of the youth encountered the notorious gang culture of Los Angeles, which helped to create, I'm afraid, that is to say the culture of violence and the gang culture of Los Angeles, this MS-13, which Mr. Trump regularly demonizes. And then there's Honduras. Uh, You know that during the war against the Sandinista regime in the 1980s, Honduras was turned into a virtual U.S. military base, and the adjunct to that diabolical process was sending Hondurans fleeing northward. Uh, many of those who are now camped out in Baja, California, just across the border from San Diego, are Honduran. And Mr. Trump, of course, does not make reference to this, or rarely do his uh, media opposition make reference to this either. But what really is concerning is that I think that all of this may be a prelude, as some have suggested, to Mr. Trump announcing a state of emergency, which would allow him, he thinks, to build this base through the efforts of the Pentagon. Now, that could be challenged in court, but the courts have been packed. And in any case, uh, recall the Korematsu case from World War II, when Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt helped to intern thousands upon thousands of people of Japanese ancestry, uh, based not least upon emergency powers. And a Supreme Court justice said at that time that these emergency powers were like a loaded weapon. And now that loaded weapon is in the hands of the current occupant of the Oval Office, it could be a prelude on the cracking down of civil liberties generally. And if I were in Mexico City right now, I'd be very concerned. The United States has already uh, attacked Mexican soil by lobbing tear tear gas across the border. A good deal of U.S. territory, as we speak, is basically former Mexican territory. Uh, We know that there was more than a scintilla of racism involved in Mr. Trump's speech last night. And as... I was watching that speak. It's, I was thinking actually of Ida B. Wells Barnett, the anti-lynching crusader, who in the 1890s uh, talked at length about how the demonizing of men of African descent in particular was a prelude to their lynching, that is to say executed without due process of law in the hundreds, if not thousands, and the demonizing of people of Mexican origin in particular I would hope and I would imagine will be of grave concern to the newly installed left-wing government in Mexico City, which uh, I dare say the United States is already trying to destabilize. And uh, if I were in Mexico City, I'd start really thinking seriously about foreign policy and foreign alliances. And in that vein, uh, the newly installed president, uh, Lopez Obrador, AMLO, uh, made a point that we all should... um, take heed of. He said that if people in Washington were that concerned about the migration flow northward, they would do something to perhaps start, in my terms, a a, a new New Deal, an old-fashioned New Deal, as opposed to the Green New Deal, which we talk about so much in this country, for Central America that would create jobs to keep people there. And he said, Mr. Lopez Obrador, that if Washington was not interested, he'd go to China to see if that kind of investment capital and economic and state-directed investment could be engineered so that we could avoid these kinds of human rights catastrophes. And uh, I hope that if Mr. Lopez Obrador does decide to go to China, he will discuss more than simple economic investment in Central America. Well, apart from being a historian, you're also an attorney. And I wanted to know, what is your reaction to the the quagmire, the legal quagmire the country seems to be in? Here's a president who's, uh, you know, I've been saying on the program that this president has conducted a stick-up. He's gone into a bank and announced a hold-up, and if he doesn't get the money in the vault, he'll kill everybody. Uh, Do you recall a time when... As many as 800 
2,000 workers were targeted by a president and uh, compelled to work without pay? Well, as you know, there is a lawsuit unfolding as we speak precisely on that point of forcing people to work without pay. But once again, we're sort of in a, in a corner because the courts have been packed and the Supreme Court in particular has been packed. I'm not one who puts much credence into this idea that Chief Justice John Roberts is going to do a switch in time and become a centrist this late in his career. And so we're in a real corner. But to a certain degree, I'm afraid to say that this is the inevitable operation of a historic trend. I mean, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that uh, Ishmael Reed, the well-known black writer and playwright and musician and linguist, uh, has a new play uh, off-Broadway, uh, which makes fun, quite frankly, of Hamilton, the blockbuster of Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, which has taken the nation by storm. According to Mr. Reed, and full disclosure, I must say that he, he quotes me in the play, that uh, th this is a travesty of history. I mean, a slave owner's rebellion, a class struggle in many ways uh, involving enslaved Africans on one side and slave owners led by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison on the other, with the latter prevailing. And even our friends on the left tell us that this was a great leap forward for humanity. But now I'm afraid that history has caught up with this so-called grand experiment in North America. And in light of the rise of China in particular, and in light of the liberation of Africa over the past 60 to 70 years, the low-hanging fruit that U.S. imperialism could readily plot uh, has been shrinking. And uh, not only that, the same holds true for their European allies. I'm thinking of Britain, which is committing slow-motion suicide right now over Brexit. <clears throat> and likewise, the safety valve in the Americas, which allowed European nations to export their so-called surplus populations, Irish Americans, Italian Argentines, for example, to name two examples amongst many, well, that's basically been cut off in light of events of recent decades. And so you have this growing crisis, not only in the United States, but amongst its allies. Mr. Trump comes into office, and he decides that what he's going to do is create, instead of allies, vassal states uh, led by the Europeans. But, of course, I think, I think that they're too powerful to be placed in that position, which thereby is helping to create and help to instigate a further crisis right here in Washington, D.C. In your writings, in your research, has the United States uh, ever had as a head of state somebody with such uh, a very troubling psychological profile? <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know, I'm not a psychologist. I don't even play one on the radio. But <laughs> I, I did find it striking that if you look at some of the portraits in the press of Mr. Trump speaking from the Oval Office, looming above him is his favorite U.S. president, Andrew Jackson, a noted uh, genocide dare, a, a man who waged a vicious and bloody wars against Native Americans in the 1820s. Uh, sent them fleeing to what they thought would be their homeland in Oklahoma from their erstwhile actual home in what is now the southeast United States, a man who was a traitor in Africa, a slave trader. And without putting Andrew Jackson on the couch, anyone who is engaged in such <laughs> bloodthirstiness, it seems to me, has to be by definition addled to a certain extent. And in any case... Even though I do see Mr. Trump as being an unusual character, I think it's very important to put him in the tapestry of U.S. history and not to separate him from U.S. history and act like he's some sort of sui generis one-off character, but to see him as the logical outcome to a certain degree of a certain motion of history. More to the point, 
particularly concerning your point about labor and people working without pay, we have to recognize that over the past 60 to 70 years, there was concerted effort to defeat and destabilize class-based organizations, particularly unions. I think of the West Coast longshoremen under Harry Bridges in the first place, who, of course, was born in Australia. There was a decades-long effort to deport him back to Australia. I think of Ferdinand Smith, who I wrote a book about, uh, who was born in Jamaica, was eventually ousted and sent back to Jamaica. This is after he had helped to build the National Maritime Union, was number two leader in that powerful union. And, of course, after he was ousted, the National Maritime Union shrunk in influence and power and now presides over ships that are basically floating slums. Now, you can't have that sort of attack on class-based organizations without affecting people's political education and making certain voters, particularly, I'm afraid to say, the Euro-American sector of the electorate, particularly the working class and middle class <clears throat> Euro-American sector of the electorate, making them more susceptible to the blandishments and overtures of a figure like Donald J. Trump. You might have seen the article in the New York Times a week or two ago about Harlan County, Kentucky, uh, where you find some of the poorest people in this country heavily dependent upon food stamps, <clears throat> Medicare, yes. Social Security, et cetera. But yet they say they hate the government. Now, how do you explain that kind of conundrum? And, of course, you can easily say that then they're voting against their interests. Perhaps they are. But perhaps they're playing a long game. Perhaps they feel that if a crisis is created in this country, the clock can be turned back to an era where whiteness was valued, believe it or not, more highly than it is in 2019. For example, in 1950, I'm, I'm doing research on a project in Washington, D.C. I was reading about how Washington, D.C. in 1950, uh, black people were not allowed to be bus drivers. And in fact, the head of the bus company said that he did not want to let that happen because the white bus drivers would all go on strike if they hired one black bus driver. So I think that because our friends on the left in particular haven't been able to grasp the nettle, haven't been able to figure out what this country is made of, and have been instead existing upon romantic fantasies, now we all find ourselves, quite frankly, on the cusp perhaps, of fascism. Mm. You know, I've been talking about this very thing. Let's switch gears a bit. And uh, because you, you had uh, indicated you were going to take us on a, a, a tour of significant developments and news issues of 2018, well, the year has morphed into 2019. So with 2020 hindsight, what, where will you start this tour? Well, let's start in China. I, I, I've been thinking a lot lately about both London and Washington. And in thinking about London and the collapse of the British Empire, and as you know, and as I was just saying, Britain is now going through a kind of slow motion nervous breakdown. But a turning point for the British Empire, interestingly enough, it seems to me, comes in the 1850s of the Crimean War, uh, where it wages war against Russia. There was this obsession with Moscow and this notion that they were going to push southward and challenge the British jewel that was British India, which leads in 1905 to Britain supporting Japan and its war against Russia, a true turning point in world history. And I can go back to that if you're interested. But then Japan turns the tables on <laughs> December 8, 1941, by ousting Britain from its colonial nodes in Singapore and Hong Kong, not least, which marks the beginning and the end of the British Empire. And then you come to the United States of America, the successor to the British Empire, the revolting spawn of London, as I say in my book, The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism. And it, too, is obsessed with Moscow, which leads Nixon to go to China in 1972, work out an anti-Soviet entente with Beijing. And I might also say parenthetically, uh, and, uh, it helps to bring Japan to heel as well. And we can go into that if you're interested. But 
that also leads to this deal that creates massive foreign direct investment into China, uh, which creates a, this apparent unstoppable juggernaut. And as you know, in recent days, uh, Tim Cook of Apple has said that his once trillion dollar corporation uh, may be seeing uh, reduced profit margins going forward, not least because what's happening not only in terms of this trade war between China and the United States, which it seems to me is either going to end with a U.S. climb down or a U.S. force climb down. But we, we shall see. But in any case, it's shaping U.S. foreign policy. It ties directly into the Singapore summit in mid-June 2018 with Chairman Kim and Mr. Trump, because Mr. Trump, the Mayberry Machiavelli, feels that he can get an ally on the northeast Chinese border. I think that he's misguided and mistaken, but we shall see. It also helps to underscore and explain his rather erratic attempts at the end of 2018 to talk about withdrawing U.S. troops from Syria, slashing their numbers in Afghanistan to clear the decks for a focus on China. Keep in mind as well that AFRICOM, uh, the U.S. military force targeting Africa, has been reduced with the explicit idea that uh, now they're going to focus more on China. Indeed, if you look at one of the biggest uh, cultural events of 2018, the movie Black Panther, which some, some expect to do well at the Oscars, you can even connect that to China because the biggest cinema market right now is in China. And Disney, which invested a small fortune in Black Panther, possibly was responding to the fact that China's biggest blockbuster, the Chinese movie that was the biggest blockbuster right before Black Panther was released, is Wolf Warrior II, which takes place in a fictional African country in many ways is more militantly anti-racist than Black Panther, and in some ways, I think future historians may connect the rise of Black Panther, Panther to the Chinese blockbuster Wolf Warrior II. So you see this obsession with China, but at the same time, relations with Moscow are deteriorating. Uh, take close attention, which you can find online, to the March 1, 2018 speech of Vladimir Putin announcing the development of this hypersonic missile which can evade the most sophisticated air defenses, including those that supposedly guard Washington, D.C. And that was repeated at his end of the year, December 2018, press conference. Washington is in the very difficult position of having negative relations with both uh, Beijing and Moscow simultaneously. And once again, the mainstream press is not helping. Recall the remarks that Mr. Trump made in the Oval Office just a few days ago, at the end of December 2018, if I'm not, not mistaken, where he talked disparagingly about Afghanistan and suggested that it had something to do with the collapse of the Soviet Union, which, of course, is something that Zbigniew Brzezinski, who began under Jimmy Carter, uh, helping to interfere in the internal affairs of a left-leaning regime in Kabul, Afghanistan, he, Mr. Brzezinski, before he passed away a year or two ago, acknowledged as much. But on MSNBC, a host whose name I will not mention, disparaged this idea, said that Mr. Trump got his talking point from Moscow, said that she could not find any evidence in, on this side of the Atlantic that anybody held that opinion. I started to email her and say, you should look at what I was writing back in the day. Because you know, everybody, <laughs> matter of fact, NPR brought a guy on to talk about this, uh, whose book is titled something like The Graveyard of Empire speaking of Afghanistan and how it helped to weaken the British Empire and then the Soviet Union, then he came on in order to pack this MSNBC uh, opinion, basically dismissed the idea that Afghanistan had anything to do with the weakening of the Soviet Union. So this is the problem that U.S. imperialism faces. Uh, they have these formidable antagonists in both Moscow and in Beijing, and yet the dominating the airwaves and the mode of communication, progressive FM aside, are these hosts and communicators who are not above misleading their audiences. Is it your view that the, there is a, a new power emerging? It's not the United States anymore or Britain or even Russia for that matter. But there is 
a new power emerging and it is attracting the fidelity of so-called third world nations. It's, it's attracting a lot of uh, attention and support from this quarter. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, I've been warning uh, some folks, even the progressive community, to be careful about their fixation on the role of China and Africa, for example. Uh, instead, what they might want to pay attention to is an Al Jazeera piece of a few days ago that said, quote, China love, Africa loves China, which is a, a slight exaggeration, but I think it makes the point. In any case, uh, as you know, China has helped to finance the Museum of Black Civilization in Dakar, Senegal, just built a world-class library at the University of Dar es Salaam in uh, Tanzania, in southeastern Africa. And in any case, I think that those who are sincerely concerned about Africa should be concerned, for example, about the role of France, which is the historic vampire on the continent of Africa. And indeed, the opening of this Museum of Black Civilization is going to lead to a cry for France to return all the loot that it took out of West Africa and Senegal, not least, in recent decades, and took to museums in Paris. I should also say folks should pay close attention to the role of Saudi Arabia in Africa. When you had this very important development of 2018, which was the Entente, the peace agreement between Ethiopia and Eritrea, it was not accidental that that was ratified in Saudi Arabia. In fact, one of the most disturbing stories of 2018, if not before, is the fact that in their genocidal war in Yemen, right across the Red Sea from Eritrea and Ethiopia, by the way, Saudi Arabia has been recruiting child soldiers in Darfur, Sudan, which, as you know, is one of the more underdeveloped regions on planet Earth, and bringing them to fight in Yemen and basically deployed as cannon fodder. They've been accompanied in this dastardly crime by their usual partner, the UAE, United Arab Emirates. And if you're trying to understand the rise of religious zealotry, usually the finger is pointed at the Balkans and Bosnia, but you could just as easily point the finger at uh, East Africa, uh, point the finger at Saudi Arabia, not least in Somalia. And this is something that I'm afraid to say, that just as Washington has become much more hysterical, about the role of China, uh, some of our friends on the left, interestingly enough, have become more hysterical too, which brings me to the speech given at the end of 2018 by National Security Advisor John Bolton, who uh, you may know basically reneged on a Trump campaign promise, which was to slash foreign aid by giving a speech where, of course, he demonized China, he demonized Russia, and said that the United States is going to try to compete in terms of now doling out foreign aid to Africa. Well, you know, if you believe that, there's a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell to you, because a few decades ago, uh, then U.S. President George H.W. Bush announced quite correctly that Washington had more will than wallet when it comes to foreign aid, and that's not going to change anytime soon, particularly from a president who has referred to an entire continent with a barnyard epithet that I cannot repeat on this family radio outlet, and then, to avoid domestic tensions at home, sent his wife packing on a tour of Africa, which she then used as a backdrop to model uh, colonial-era <laughs> clothes. Uh, and and her piss helmet. Yes, of the sort you haven't seen since Merle Street started out of Africa. So... Once again, the, the point that I'd like to leave the audience with is that Washington somehow has stumbled into this untenable relationship with China, and it's shaping U.S. foreign policy generally, it's shaping U.S. cultural policy, as my re reflection on Black Panther tends to suggest. And I say this as a person who <laughs> cannot be accused of being an apologist for China, I mean, in, in my upcoming book on Southern Africa, I excoriate Beijing's role in Southwestern Africa and Angola in particular in the 1970s when it found itself anomalously, anomalously on the side of apartheid South Africa 
and combating Cuban troops who had been dispatched there to repel apartheid South Africa. But uh, unlike some in Washington, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm part of the reality-based community. I believe in dealing with realities, and uh, I believe in writing history and studying history, but not being a captive of history. What is your sense of a uh, of direction in terms of foreign and domestic policy among the, the, the big guys, United States and China, do you get a sense that they have a cogent approach, they have a cogent philosophy about what it is they ought to be doing at this time? Or do you get a sense that they're kind of scattered and things change from day to day, almost literally from day to day, so that it's no longer just a long-term view, but it seems to me, just looking from the outside, that foreign policy, especially among these nations, has become decidedly uh, short-sighted. Well, with regard to Washington, I, I think the, the line from Washington has been remarkably consistent. Uh, that is to say, Washington is hotly opposed to redistribution of the wealth, not least in its so-called backyard in Central America. And Washington is opposed to state intervention or state-directed di- state economies, which is one of the reasons why it's so hostile to Cuba, hostile to Venezuela, and why it's hostile to the Made in China 2025 policy, which is the subject of these tense negotiations that are taking place as we speak in Beijing, I'm of that school of thought which suggests that it's going to be very difficult for Washington and Beijing to come to some sort of agreement. As a matter of fact, here's where you'll know that Washington is involved in a climb now. Mr. Trump has a press conference or goes into the White House briefing room and suggests that China is about to buy billions of dollars in soybeans, more Boeing airplanes, uh, perhaps uh, even allow for the opening of more Starbucks cafes in Shanghai. But he doesn't mention anything about Made in China 2025, which foresees an era that actually is just over the horizon, perhaps within a few years, where China will be the global leader, not only in 5G telecommunications, but also in artificial intelligence and robotics and green energy and quantum computing, all directed by the state. Now, if Mr. Trump has a press conference where he mentions the former, all of these purchases, which could add up to billions and billions and billions of dollars, but not talk about the state role in the Chinese economy, you'll know that Washington's in the process of a climb down, although that does not mean necessarily that Washington will be surrendering. So I think that that particular policy has been clear. Recall that it was 1989 to 1991 that Washington, uh, of course, took this very, shall we say, hostile approach to then existing socialism in Eastern Europe, not least because they were state-directed economies. Washington threatened to blow up the world unless uh, socialism was abandoned. And uh, socialism was abandoned. And now you have uh, capitalism in Russia. They don't like capitalism either. It reminds me of uh, how Washington deals with the black community. When you have people like Paul Robeson, socialist oriented, they don't like them. Okay, fine. Then you have black nationalists, they don't like them either. (laughs) And so maybe you come to the point that at least with regard to the black community, they don't like the black community generally, no matter what the ideological orientation. And I think that this is a problem that Washington is failing to come to grips with concerning China. That is to say, even if China, which it has, allowed a role for private investment in the economy, that's not enough to sate the voracious appetite of U.S. imperialism. In... Africa, in the continent of Africa, what did you see in 2018 that gave you pause? 
Well, first of all, of course, there's the Entente between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Many of my Ethiopian friends think that this might be a false dawn, but certainly, at least in the short term, it should allow both countries to spend more on health, education, and welfare than they had been spending on the military. Uh, similarly, the election in Zimbabwe recalled that longtime, long-term leader Robert Mugabe was toppled in a kind of palace coup in November 2017, leading to elections in 2018, which his party won, uh, even according to the most uh, prejudiced of, of observers. And this was significant because one of the major reasons why that party, ZANU-PF, got into such, such hot water with the North Atlantic powers was the attempt to reverse the fruits of settler colonialism. That is to say that the European minority in Zimbabwe uh, were subjected to land reform, given the fact that their roots in Zimbabwe were rather shallow, many of them not all arriving until post-1945 with the end of World War II, uh, few being there before the 1890s, unlike South Africa, where the European minorities roots stretched back to 1652. But Washington was not having it, nor was Australia, nor was London. Punishing sanctions were slapped on Zimbabwe, which drove the economy into the ditch, leading to world-class inflation and inevitably pressure that led to the dispatching of Robert Mugabe. Yet despite that, and despite the signal that was sent to settler colonialists all around the world, not least in North America, in Australia, New Zealand, and of course Israel, despite that unmistakable signal, the voters of Zimbabwe stuck with ZANOPF, which is something worthy of investigation. Likewise, I think an important development with regard to 2018 was something that happened as that year was expiring. I'm speaking of the elections in the Congo, which have yet to be settled. You know that Joseph Kabila, the president, was forced to step down, not least because of international pressure and domestic pressure, I should add. Congo, which is larger than the United States, east of the Mississippi, and larger than Western Europe, is a storehouse of minerals and wealth, including coltan, which is part of my mobile phone and yours, too, and your audiences, too. And yet uh, we have this election that's unsettled, even though, interestingly enough, the neighbors led by South Africa are willing to say that these elections were legitimate, the North Atlantic powers are balking, so that's the drama that's still unfolding uh, as we speak. Similarly, let's look at what, what happened in Libya. Uh, that crisis continues as a result of the ill-advised uh, overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. And that, of course, led to a particular kind of persecution of darker-skinned people in Libya, some of whom were reduced, quite frankly, to slavery. It helped to create a refugee crisis, not least in Italy, which then was whipped up by demagogic politicians to help to bring neo-fascists to power. And of all of the misdeeds that were committed and perpetrated by the predecessor of Mr. Trump, I would say that this continuing tragedy of Libya has to be ranked as number one. Wow. What, what about indigenous, the struggles of indigenous peoples? Uh, was there a great deal of progress made or still to be made? Well, I would say both. I, I was quite struck with an interview by uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez of Bronx and Queens, where she said that the acceleration of her own consciousness uh, was sparked as a result of the Standing Rock demonstrations in the Dakotas, where you had indigenous people protesting against the plunder of their land, particularly for ill-fated uh, energy ventures. I'm also rather pleased and heartened by the fact that the movement for sovereignty in Hawaii uh, continues to gather strength. As a matter of fact, I would say that in terms of indigenous struggles, under the U.S. flag, the struggles of the indigenous people of Hawaii are probably more advanced than any other indigenous struggle under the U.S. flag. And likewise, 
uh, I would like to say that with regard to New Zealand, the struggles of the Maori people continue to influence and impact New Zealand policy. And I think one of the reasons, one of the many ways you can distinguish New Zealand from Australia is that the Maori people, the indigenous people of New Zealand, were expert fighters, particularly in trench warfare. And as a result, they fought the British settlers to a standstill to the point now where their language is an officially recognized language of New Zealand, and they wield significant influence in the body politics of New Zealand, whereas across the water in Australia, the prospects for the indigenous population there is certainly not as bright or promising, uh, which brings me, of course, to Scott Morrison, the current prime minister of Australia, uh, who makes Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil seem like left-wing radicals by comparison. And I would say that this sharp turn to the right in Australia, which somehow describes itself as the lucky country, has a lot to do with the fact that the indigenous population of Australia has been weakened so tremendously, particularly politically, which has helped to ensure that a certain kind of repugnant white supremacy has dug deep roots in that continental-sized island nation. So let's kind of take a little swing right back to where we started, and that is based on what uh, unfolded in 2018, what do you see as the hot spots or the hot issues for 2019? Well, let's start just south of the border, Mexico. Um, I, I was struck by the fact that Mexico refused to sign on to this anti-Venezuela declaration led by Brazil and the United States. Uh, that was very wise on the part of Mexico, but at the same time, the Mexican government is going to have to be very careful, careful and has to make sure that it's not isolated uh, in the Americas. Uh, certainly watch Northeast Asia, because the world is moving on from Donald Trump. Remember when Donald Trump came into office in January 2017? One of the first things he did was withdraw from the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But the TPP did not collapse. It basically reorganized under uh, Japanese leadership. And so now you have this free trade agreement incorporating nations of the Pacific that's led by Japan. In some ways, it helps to establish, if not reestablish, the uh, co-prosperity sphere, which Tokyo tried to organize in the 1940s, which led directly to this clash with the United States during World War II and the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This new trade agreement led by Japan it's also going to hamper U.S. agricultural exporters because nations like Canada, which are part of this sphere, will have an advantage over their U.S. peers and counterparts in exporting across the Pacific. And this, of course, outraged the uh, Wall Street Journal, but not enough for the Wall Street Journal editorial page to turn decisively against uh, Mr. Trump. We're also going to have to watch very carefully the elections in Nigeria. Uh, Africa is a giant. I'm sure you're following the story about President Buhari. And, you know, he, he's been out of the country quite a bit, the 75-year-old leader, uh, apparently hospitalized. But, 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 but he's, he's not even discussing that it has to do with his health. Well, what I find interesting is that the, there's a rumor in Nigeria that actually he's still out of the country. There's a body double who's uh, <laughs> masquerading as Buhari. And apparently this body double was signing a document left-handed, and Mr. Buhari is apparently right-handed. <laughs> and um, so who, who knows if this guy is still alive? <laughs> but in any case, uh, he's going to be running for re-election. Likewise, we're going to have to watch what's happening in the South African elections. The African National Congress, uh, under the leadership of Cyril Ramaphosa, you know that uh, his predecessor, Jacob Zuma, was forced out of office. Mr. Zuma, you may recall, has just signed a record deal. Uh, he's going to be recording with Lady Smith Black Mombazo. Actually, Zuma's voice is not bad, quite frankly. At every political rally that he 
been, he's performed that he's uh, appeared at in recent years. He's sung, and he has a nice sounding voice. Although there's been an, uh, appeals of outrage at Lady Smith Black and Mombazo for collaborating with Mr. Zuma in, in his latest scheme. Uh, similarly, we're going to have to watch the bricks. Uh, I, I think that by the end of the year, it might be the bricks, because it's difficult for me to see how Russia, India, China, and South Africa are going to be meeting in the same room with Mr. Bolsonaro or Brazil when he's no more than a tool of Yankee imperialism. Um, either he's going to have to be ousted or he will be forced to resign. Now, speaking of Brazil, Mr. Bolsonaro is following the Yankee line on Venezuela, a watch for increased and intensified pressure on Venezuela. Already, just in the last 48 hours, Washington has announced intensified sanctions on Venezuela. But at the same time, Mr. Bolsonaro has talked about pulling away from his major tra- trading partner, uh, which is to say China. Once again, uh, tailing after U.S. imperialism. The only good news there is that if he follows through on that particular idea, it's probably going to worsen the economic crisis in Brazil, leading to his premature exit, thankfully. Well, do you have the U.S. Uh, looking to establish a military base there, and he seems to be uh, approving? Well, speaking of, of that part of the world, uh, I'm, I'm interested to get your point of view uh, with regard to the dust-up between Venezuela and Guyana. Uh, That is to say that Guyana has a major oil fine. Uh, There has been tense relations with neighboring Venezuela. As a matter of fact, some of my Guyanese friends have been pestering me to sign statements of support, castigating Venezuela. Uh, We know that Mr. Granger in Guyana uh, has been under withering fire. I assume that there will be elections in Guyana sooner rather than later. But what are they saying in Trinidad about all these events? Well, Trinidad has its own problems because, as you know, it is not an oil-producing nation. It is an oil-refining nation. And uh, because oil was so plentiful not too long ago, uh, it, it lost quite a bit of business. So the oil-refining uh, component of the economy suffered quite a bit, not to mention the fact that the government was in absolute disarray. What seems to be important at this time? Really, Guyana, which is right off the coast of Venezuela, which is right off the coast of Trinidad. I was hoping to see something of a, what's, a, more, a more sane, at least a dialogue of some sort, where because of the potential wealth that these countries have, how best to direct the wealth, how best to use that wealth, how best to channel that wealth. But I don't think it's it's getting there. I think they're still splintered. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know if there's enough of an effort made to get some sane kind of policy going where at least they have their own, you know, their own kind of OPEC in the Caribbean. Um, it, this, the, the oil reserves that they have there and the oil that is uh, being refined there, it's, it's not an insignificant amount of money. They have a lot of money. But the the countries are just shot to hell, uh, you know, lacking health care and good education and employment and these kinds of things. You wonder how it is that countries that are so blessed with natural resources still can't get it together as a group uh, and solidify their their relationships that would work for all of these countries that have suffered so long under the yoke of colonialism and exploitation. So I don't see any movement there with the with these countries coming together. And I don't understand why the friction continues. 
Well, this brings us back to where we began. That is to say that Washington gets very upset, particularly in this hemisphere, if you have movements towards equitable redistribution of the wealth. And they would prefer a system whereby oligarchs predominate. They thought that when they enunciated that kind of thinking more clearly and carefully in the late 1980s and early 1990s with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that this would mean that U.S. imperialism would prevail forevermore. They did not bank upon the fact that Chinese entrepreneurs and Russian entrepreneurs would challenge them, yet they're still clinging to that particular way of thinking in the Americas. I think another major story of 2018 that's an adjunct to what you were just referring to is the price of a barrel of oil, which has led to, for example, in certain neighborhoods in Texas, you can buy, buy a gallon of gas for less than $2 a gallon, uh, which is something we thought had gone with the wind. At the same time, the United States has become a major energy producer because of the Shell Oil explosion, S-H-A-L-E explosion, and also the expansion of natural gas production as well. This has foreign policy implications because it allows Washington to be less dependent upon Saudi Arabia, and particularly their mercurial leader, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, or Mr. Bonesaw, as he is sometimes referred to as. And at the same time, it allows Washington to be more confrontational with Russia, which is also a major oil and natural gas producer as well. That's the subtext of what's happening with regard to energy. Well, this has been a very short hour, uh, but a lot has been packed into it. And Gerald, it is always quite an education when we talk to each other and listeners are, uh, they just love you because of the way you dissect things and make things so accessible. So at some point, I know you're up to your eyeballs and work trying to finish these two books and get them ready. Uh, but let's think of a, a way to uh, have people just ask you questions because I know there are tons of questions they'd like to ask you. So it's, I know it's not going to be immediate, but just keep it in the back of your mind and let's work on something that no discussions, just questions and answers. How about Sounds that? good. Keep me posted. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for being with us today. And I look forward to discussing your books when they're ready. Oh, I look forward myself. <laughs> that brings us to the end of our program today, folks. Uh, it is always such a joy to talk with uh, the esteemed professor. And as you can tell, he is just so accessible and uh, quite a wise man to talk to. We'll see each other tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>